Hello, everybody. Welcome. I'm so glad that you're all here. I can see your very colorful panels under my participant tab, and it looks like um, there's lots of folks here, and we're really, really glad that you're here. Um, we're all super enjoying air meet um, because, you know, it's no fun once you figure out one platform to just stick with it. So we're all in a new platform now, and it's really fun um, to enjoy all the bugs that will know, like, uh, will definitely be hitting us. But we're good to go. Um, I wanted to direct your attention to a few things. Um, if you're not in Chrome, that is the recommended browser for this platform. Um, folks are using other things with some success, but if you have trouble, you might want to try relaunching in Chrome. That might make it easier for you. Um, I wanted to show you the window. It should be over on your right hand side where you can see all the stuff that you need to make this panel work for you. Um, first of all, you will see the chat um, and you'll see that Cherise already put a little hello in there. We'd love you to say hi and tell us where you're joining from if you want, maybe what your role is too. I'm sure we have a mix of pretty different folks from um, faculty, designers, librarians, all sorts of folks. So uh, feel free to introduce yourself there in the chat. But I also want to direct you to next to the chat, you'll see those little um, talk bubbles. That is the Q&A. And it would be really helpful if you had questions um, for the panelists as we go to, um, it's fine to put stuff in the chat, chat back and forth, that's fine. But if you actually have a question that you want asked, please use that Q&A because it'll make it a lot easier for me to moderate as we go through. Um, and the more you put in the Q&A right from the start, the better we'll be because we've left lots of time to engage with your questions. So that's what we're doing there. Um, the closed captioning is down at the bottom. You'll see the little CC. So if you need that, you can go ahead and turn it on. And we do have a hashtag for today, SLS22, if you are a tweeter, um, a Twitterer, whatever it is you say. So um, I'm really glad uh, that you are here and I'm really glad that our panelists are here some of whom I know from the Twitterverse and some of whom I am meeting for the first time um, right here today. So I'm really excited to learn with them as, as you do. Um, I'm gonna start with just one quick uh, introduction of my own to talking about um, social annotation and hypothesis in my own life. And it was um, many years ago, many moons ago, in the before times, as we say now. Um, and in the before times, I um, had decided to build a little bit of a of an digital anthology because I learned about Creative Commons and realized that I could probably replace all of the early American early American lit texts that my students were reading and paying big money to Norton and Heath and you know Bedford St. Martins, I could probably replace those with public domain versions of that early literature and build a digital anthology. So my students and I actually did this together and we built a, a digital anthology and um, I put, I don't even know how I initially found out about it, but there was this little upstart company called Hypothesis and they had made this digital annotation tool and Somebody showed me, because believe me, I did not know how to do anything, but somebody showed me how to put it into this little book that we had built for the class. And what was really cool, first of all, was that um, I was so enamored with Hypothesis because as far as I could tell, commercial ed tech was starting to eat my public university alive, right? There was this sort of sense that if you just paid enough money, you could get the tool that was going to innovate um, the university out of all of its budget problems. And I loved Hypothesis because it was nonprofit. It was built with educators and they were talking to me. They were like helping me learn how to use the tool. They were asking me what I wanted to do with it. Um, they were kind of a new group. And I met uh, Jeremy Dean through that process. And they kind of worked with my class on experimenting with how to annotate this little anthology that we built. I had about 18 students in that class, and at the end of the semester, they had put over 10,000 annotations into this little book we built, which I'm sure was way more than they had put in any paper book we had used before. So I got kind of excited about how that was working, and it really led to a total transformation of my teaching, like no joke. 
Um, the combination of the anthology software I was using, which was Pressbooks, another open source software, and Hypothesis really led me to open pedagogy, which is sort of the pedagogical house in which I dwell now. And I, I think about open pedagogy really as having kind of two main strands. Um, the first that it sees learning as a path to social justice. And I'm, I'm using Sarah Lambert's work here. I'll put it in the chat in a little bit. Um, but she talks about redistributive justice, right? Um, with the open source tools and, um, and sort of thinking more about public access that more people can have access to the conversations and to the learning. And we sort of redistribute knowledge so that it's not just concentrated into elite place spaces. Um, also recognitive justice, which is that students can start to recognize themselves in the materials. Um, so in the sidebar, no matter what you're reading, you can hear the voices of people like you, of you, of your, of your classmates. Um, and then to a certain degree, you have a kind of representation in what knowledge looks like. You start to affect what knowledge is by contributing to that commons. Um, and then second, it's uh, open pedagogy sees learning as collaborative and ongoing. The idea that um, there may be an idea out there, but as more diverse voices um, process that idea, think about that idea, that knowledge will be improved over time. And I will tell you, this changed everything about how I'd been teaching. You know, I went from being, I think, a pretty solid teacher for 15, 20 years all of my practice is transformed within a couple of semesters because of the doors that opened through this project that I did. So I'm really excited um, to be hearing from these other folks who come from diverse areas um, of our fields because we, you know, we come from teaching, we come from instructional design. There's lots, and some of us are using hypothesis in scholarship. So what we're really focused on today is the practices. You know, what do you do? What things come up for you? So please take a look again at that Q&A button. And as you're hearing from these different folks, you can feel free to note their name if you have a question for a specific one. Um, but I'm going to ask each panelist um, in their turn to start with a brief introduction of themselves and then uh, give us just about five minutes of how you use hypothesis or social annotation um, and what you think are some of the big takeaways, challenges, that kind of stuff. So uh, we will go in order here um, that I have written down, but if at any point, you know, you guys wanna jump in, that's that's fine. We'll have time for sort of crosstalk um, after everybody presents. So if it's okay, we will start with Mari Tez. Thank you so much, Robin. Uh, it's such an honor to be here with you and with all of the attendees today at the Social Learning Summit. How exciting. Um, I'm going to share my screen with you. And um, as Robin said, my name is Maritez, Maritez Apigo, and I'm the Distance Education Coordinator, Open Educational Resources Coordinator, and an English professor at Contra Costa College. I'm using hypothesis in my freshman reading and composition courses. Um, our college is uh, part of the California Community College System. We're located in San Pablo, uh, which is on the cusp of Richmond, if you're familiar with uh, the Bay Area. Um, at our college, we have a population of 90% students of color. And my classes are online and hybrid classes. And I've been using uh, hypothesis in two of my classes. One is called English 1A, which is a reading and composition class, and an English 1A X class, which is um, also a reading and composition class. Um, and this class has an ESL focus. So I teach ESL students, advanced ESL students in that class. And I'm using the reading apprenticeship framework. And let me drop a link for you all in the chat in case you're interested in learning more about this. This is from West Ed. And, um, and they really incorporate four dimensions of reading, the social, the personal, the cognitive, and knowledge building. Um, I really love reading apprenticeship because it 
has its students engage in metacognitive conversations about what they're reading. Um, we, I use a think aloud model at first where um, I kind of model for the students what's going on in my mind as I'm reading and kind of slowing down um, the, 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 all the great strategies that happen in the mind of a good reader. Um, and then um, after modeling that for students, they also um, start to learn those things and practice them with one another. And um, Hypothesis has been a wonderful space for us to uh, apply this framework um, because in the margins of the text, you see the whole conversation of what students are thinking um, and what they're engaging with one another about the text. So I really love the, this framework. Um, I'm also incorporating some specific reading strategies with my students, and these are the six uh, strategies that we're focusing on. Um, and so the first one is to make connections that good readers, they notice different pieces of text that relate to or remind them of something else in their lives or other books or movies that they might have seen or um, even people or issues. We're practicing how students um, could visualize what they read in their mind that they can have a picture um, or even see a movie of what is happening in the text. Students are practicing asking questions uh, before they read, during their reading, and even after to better understand uh, the meaning of that text. We're also practicing uh, inferencing. So um, they're drawing conclusions based on their own background knowledge and the clues in the text. They're looking for what is important and um, they're looking at different text features, um, any kind of visuals. Um, and they're also, um, after they're reading, they're going to be writing. So they're also thinking of um, what might be important quotes that they can cite later on in their writing. And then lastly, uh, students are also practicing a reading comprehension strategy of synthesizing, um, combining new information from what they just read with their existing knowledge and forming new ideas and interpretations. So those are the ones that I really love to, uh, to have my students practice. Um, and my students um, are the authority um, just like Robin said earlier, uh, learning is a collaborative experience in my classes um, as the students are exchanging ideas with one another in the margins. Um, I've gotten some really amazing feedback from my students. 86% uh, of them said that they found this really useful as a learning tool. 72% um, said that it really helped them think critically about the reading. 64% said it helped them understand what they're reading. And 64% also mentioned that they learned a lot from their classmates' annotations. So, um, so by engaging with one another in the margins, they're learning from one another at the same time. And I do have one uh, quote I'd like to share with you uh, from a student who told me that hypothesis is great for discussing aspects of the reading and expanding on each other's annotations. I like being able to see which highlighted parts of the reading stood out to other students and seeing if someone wrote annotations about the same parts that I did. So I'm gonna pause right here. Thank you so much. Lovely. Um, and we're already um, got some discussion going in the Q&A. So I just want to remind you, keep popping it in there. And I also want to say uh, there's no right kind of question. So if you want to ask something really instrumental about a technology or you need a link or whatever, put it in there. Um, but you can also ask broad conceptual questions as well. So we welcome anything. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to our next speaker, um, who will be Dana. All right. Give me one second to pull up my screen here. I 
hopefully people see it. Perfect. Okay. And don't forget also, guys, you have those reactions at the bottom. And look, like you can flood the screen with all sorts of joy. So, oh you know, let it fly. Okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, my name is Dana Conard. Um, I work for online education at U University of California, Santa Cruz. Um, my role is a uh, instructional technology specialist. So I'm an interesting intersect in this panel as I'm not a formal instructor, but I do teach teachers about technology. Um, I'm also a secondary source for um, hypothesis in the classroom, but instructors are always really happy to share things that they love and also equally vocal about things that they don't like. Not hypothesis, but you know, anything that's going on in their classrooms. Um, to breeze through the rest of these bullet points, um, online education, um, we are a team of educators, instructional designers, and technology specialists who work with instructors to develop online and hybrid courses. Um, during the transition to emergency remote uh, instruction, our unit was in a unique place to be able to support the entire campus uh, as they suddenly had to learn instructional technologies like Canvas and Zoom, things that we rely on today. Um, our unit also works very closely with our Center for Innovations and Teaching and Learning unit. So we were a nice double team of pedagogy informed decisions and assisting instructors with the techno technological aspects of implementing the things that they wanted to do in their classroom. Uh, and a bit about UCSC, you've probably read this already, but we're a pretty big school. Um, the first UC school to adopt Hypothesis as, a, as my personal badge of honor here in fall 2020. Um, our mascot is the banana slug, which hopefully explains the image that you see at the bottom right of this. It is a banana slug laying on a book with a heart above its head. Um, so again, my teacher experience is a summation of teachers come to me and saying the things that they really like about um, Hypothesis. It's also really heavily informed by my excellent colleague, Megan McNamara, who uh, had a lot to say about her use of Hypothesis in la this last quarter. Um, of course, there are other benefits, but these are the ones that I hear most commonly from our instructors. So fantastic low stakes assessments. One of the biggest shifts that we saw at our campus, and I'm sure many campuses, was moving away from high stakes assessments to uh, low stake assignments like this. Students really loved um, hypothesis because it was far less stressful than you know weekly quizzes or high stake assessment or exams at the end of a, a unit or a quarter. Um, more, far more engaging to read. A uh, near constant source of frustration that I heard from instructors was that uh, it's hard to just get students to read. Hypothesis does this so much better than uh, when the instructor just posts their readings as a file on Canvas. Uh, and even if the student doesn't necessarily read all of the text in Hypothesis, they're reading some. And they're able to uh, engage with it a lot deeper than if they had been passively reading it. Uh, interacting with the text like this in an active learning activity results in much stickier learning for them. So it's a benefit to them. Uh, community building, um, as, as other people have mentioned too, it's, it's not just seeing your own annotations uh, and how they populate the text, but also seeing how other people interact with the text. So um, not just students strictly consuming the course materials one-on-one, -on -one, but learning as a community together. Um, I saw a lot of comments that were, um, to second, um, Maritas, uh, students learning from each other and saying, I had the same issue or not the same, issue. I had the same thought um, and connecting to other students' annotations. Um, my favorite is the equalizing student voices. Um, I was a very shy student. And if there was, if I was in class and we were discussing a reading, I had very slim chance that I would raise my hand and participate, um, even if I did the reading. And it's not because that I didn't have an opinion, um, but I'm far more comfortable sharing uh, via text, then I would be raising my hand and sharing out loud. Um, with text, I can formulate what I have to say. Um, so with hypothesis, it really allowed me, would allow a student a space to practice what they're going to say so that they're able to edit their annotation, post privately to them, draft it, and then post it. So it's, it's equalizing uh, for those students. And also everyone participates. So um, uh, no one student gets to dominate the conversation as what might happen in a, in a in life discussion. Um, as I said, mainly my role is teaching teachers about hypothesis, how it benefits their students and helping them get set up. Um, hypothesis is really helpful about, um, their tool is so hands-on and the best way to get them to know it is a hands-on demo of it. Um, once they start using it, you can start to see their gears turning about other ways that they can start using it that aren't just texts like uh, syllabus annotations or annotating lecture slides. Um, 
Uh, to help with this, I created a self-paced Canvas course uh, about everything hypothesis, how to use it, why to use it, sample guidelines, and a lot of resources for instructors in a centralized Canvas course. Uh, my favorite activity uh, at the top of the course is uh, the screenshot that you see on the slide. It is a kind of meta hypothesis uh, activity uh, where I'm asking them, I made a Google doc of the key features of hypothesis and they annotate directly on the instruction page while using the tool. So it's a good way to introduce it to them while they're using it. Um, the other big sell that I have for hypothesis for instructors was it's so flexible. Um, Flexible for any modality. Our campus started transitioning to mostly in-person at the beginning of this year, um, but as we all probably experienced, that was a little bit of a flux. Um, hypothesis is totally immune to these modality shifts. Teaching in person, emergency remote, hybrid or online works for all scenarios. Uh, and looking at the dashboard of our hypothesis activity as a campus, we had the highest number of annotations per day and students per day in our spring quarter that just finished. Um, so it's interesting that teachers are continuing to use this tool even now that we're back to 90% in person. So however you're teaching, you can still use it. And my last slide is the, the unexpected benefits of hypothesis. Um, I wanted to share how hypothesis has quietly pushed accessibility in a really good way. Um, since hypothesis requires optical character recognition and instructors mostly didn't know what that meant, uh, I had to figure it out and then uh, do it for them. Um, this was my first step into document remediation. At first, I was only doing uh, OCR because that's all hypothesis required, but it's become, I've learned so much more now about document uh, remediation and accessibility. Um, so now I'm not just doing OCR, but I'm doing tags and reading order and appropriate metadata. And uh, by and large, all of the, the files are far more accessible than what they had before. Um, this also allowed me to start a conversation about accessibility with instructors. Uh, when they had asked me about OCR, I can share other accessibility best practices that can inform their teaching. Sometimes it's really hard to talk to instructors about accessibility because it can kind of feel punitive or they can feel targeted or shame for not being 100% compliant, but this opens up the dialogue in a much better way. Um, and, I, and to their praise, Hypothesis really cares about accessibility too. We recently had a blind student who relied on a screen reader. When I reached out to Hypothesis to see how, how she would use it, um, no less than three Hypothesis people met with me, the teacher and the student, uh, to talk about her experience and take her feedback. Uh, so it was very valuable and we feel very supported by Hypothesis and it's been a great tool in addition to our campus. Uh, last quick slide, um, the Self-Based Canvas course is available. I'll drop it in the chat. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> Uh, publicly available. You can visit it. I dropped it in the chat. Uh, it's not in Canvas comments, but I'm happy to share it with anyone. So that is it. Thank you so much, Dana. I know people were definitely lighting up when you were talking about the accessibility stuff. And totally. it really makes me think too about, again, Sarah Lambert's piece on open pedagogy and social justice, because I think thinking about access, accessibility, um, not so much just in terms of like tech tools, but as a mindset with which you approach your teaching and your pedagogy. Um, and I feel like, you know, the making sure that the tool is accessible, sort of one piece of that, but then thinking about, you know, all of those sort of access pieces um, as you move into like using digital tools, um, it, it's it's really interesting. I'm also um, interested, maybe some of you guys have, and we could talk about this later, whether people have experience um, with how people do with mobile phone use, um, just because it's always one of the challenges when you're dealing with open source stuff that's an and OER that you're using online and you're doing um, annotation. But of course, so many of our students have trouble um, affording, you know, my students can aff often afford laptops, but a lot of times they're really shitty laptops and they're um, not working half the time. So, so anyway, really great stuff for us to talk about. So we'll talk more about accessibility um, as we go on. Uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over next to um, Christine, who's going to um, take it away. Hi everybody. Um, so before I begin, I'm gonna give everybody a break from slides. I did not present slides. Um, I just actually want to tell a story of hypothesis. Um, I'm an instructional designer here at Colgate University in upstate New York, 
We are a small residential college of about 3,000 students and 300 faculty. Um, as an instructional designer, I am in ITS, Information Technology Services here at Colgate, but we partner very closely with our Center for Teaching and Learning. Um, I have been supporting Hypothesis for um, five years here at Colgate, so I very much supported it before the pandemic, through the pandemic, and it has been something that has stuck. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about why I think that is the case at the end. Um, but for context, here at Colgate, we are a residential college, so at, we do not do any online courses at all. So the pandemic, a lot of the same growing pains were experienced by faculty here. So I just think that's important context. When I work with faculty, it's in um, around their use of hypothesis. It's for um, in-person, face-to-face courses. Um, so I thought for my 10 minute presentation that I wanted to tell you all the story of my favorite annotation that I saw a student make on a reading and it happened this past spring. But before I tell you what that annotation was, I feel like I need to set the stage, give you some context for the annotation. So I'll get to that in a moment. Um, but this annotation appeared in a course, um, an economics course. And I've been working with this faculty member for quite a few years. Um, this professor uses social annotation and hypothesis to help students navigate economic research articles. So this is a senior seminar. Students are working through some really tough <laughs> economics articles. Um, so this professor uses social annotation and hypothesis to really help students navigate a scientific research article. So one thing that this professor does is in advance of assigning the paper, he will seed the article with annotations that are meant to be guideposts to students as they work through the article. So he might provide a definition of a term so they don't have to spend time remembering what that term means. He'll just give them the definition. He'll also um, seed it with annotations to remind students that this concept relates to that concept we learned in week two, for example. Um, the annotation assignment for students is really meant, um, they're meant, students are asked to use their annotations as a way to help each other navigate the article. And students are asked to co like comment, evaluate the research design of this paper. Is this design appropriate for answering the question for the study? So that's a little bit of the context. Um, also questions and answers. It, the professor also uses it as sort of a diagnostic assessment in that way, like where are students getting hung up in this article? Or when they're answering the questions, are they giving a full answer? Um, I also want to echo what Dana said earlier, the experience of being a quiet student. Um, this professor a couple years ago noticed that the quiet students were the ones that had a lot of really insightful things to say in the margins. And this professor was just so amazed, if you will, of when the quiet students pop up in the margins and they actually have a lot to say. So I just wanted to echo that, Dana. Okay, so that's the, and I, I before I continue telling the story, that model of using social annotation as a way to help students navigate scientific research articles, that has been a pretty popular assignment here at Colgate. I've seen professors in biology and also psychology doing the same sort of assignment. But um, here at Hypothesis, we have a pretty interdisciplinary spread of the faculty who are using Hypothesis. Um, okay, so now I need to get to the reading upon which this annotation appeared. This was a reading that was authored by the professor. This professor is a tenure track professor and the article is like their big publication. Like this was a publication that they've been working many years on. It's like gonna be like the big one in their tenure dossier. So the professor assigned this his own article because of, it relates to the topic of the course, but this, the professor really told students, like, this is what it took to get this article published. Like, this paper got rejected six times before it got published in a top field journal, right? So students really kind of understood, like, the story behind what it takes to be an economist. So that's the reading. And now for the annotation. So, um, and I know this because the professor took a screenshot of this annotation. Um, so that's how I'm gonna kind of play it, describe it to you. So a student in this course highlighted 
the, the professor's name. He was the first author of the paper. So the student highlighted that his name and the annotation was what I call the boom emoji or it's actually like the collision emoji. Do you see that emoji that I just put in the chat? This student annotated the professor's name with that emoji. So the professor sent me a screenshot of that. And so what do you, what, like, what do you think of this? What, what, what is this? How should I interpret this? And to be honest, we had to Google the meaning of that emoji. Um, I actually have the web, the, um, the definition of that, mo one of the definitions of that emoji. I'm gonna put that in the chat as well. Um, and we interpreted this boom emoji to mean like, great job, like that is huge. Like, right, you're on fire, right? And, and, I just, and so then I was like, it's okay. If this is a good thing that this was a good emoji, right? And so I, I share this story because it was just, it, this happened like early this past spring and it was just, I've never seen an annotation like that before. Um, and I, I think it was just powerful on a couple different levels. So um, keeping on my time, I wanna nail it down to the two things that I really found most powerful about this. One is that hypothesis enables you to use media, right? This is a digital tool. So hypothesis recognizes emojis, but you know, also GIFs or memes or YouTube videos, you can embed um, pictures. So I just thought that this tool gave this student another way to communicate, not just like a thought, but like some emotion and some sentiment. And I think it would have been awkward actually if the if this student wrote like, hey professor, nice job on publishing this article, right? Like it the text might have been a little awkward, but somehow like the emoji captured the sentiment. So again, I think thinking from like a universal design perspective, giving students multiple ways to express themselves in the margins of a text, I think is just incredibly powerful for meaning making and for teaching and for learning. And the second thing that I found so powerful about this was again, the social element, right? Like for a student to do the boom emoji on the, off the professor's name, and then for the students who entered afterwards to see that react, like the student had that reaction, I imagine again, just like helped other students see like, hey, that was a big, that was a big achievement that the professor did. Now I understand too that um, some professors might not think an emoji is an appropriate annotation, but that's a, that's a sidebar for another time. But I just wanted to um, leave you all with that story because I think it just really captures um, a lot of positive things that were happening in the margins of a text in one particular course. So with that, I'm gonna pause and thank you for all lighting up all the screen with all those emojis. I think it was perfect for the theme of my talk. So I'll, I'll pause for now, but keep it going. <laughs> And I think we could all agree it depends whether it's appropriate or, or not depends on which emoji you True. attach to your professor's <laughs> name, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's such a great story. It actually, I can't even remember who said what because I've been listening to social annotation stuff now for hours. Um, it, Amanda or Reed or somebody there in, in another panel, they were talking about um, how to make sure that your students' annotations are substantive rather than that stuff we used to get on discussion board posts. Like, I totally agree with what you're saying about that. I agree with every single thing you said or whatever. Um, but I think there's another part that you're bringing up, Christine, which is it's also okay to sometimes not be substantive, but instead to focus on the rapport of a learning community. I feel like that's been such a big part of hypothesis in my classes. And it, it enables the substance because they end up being comfortable with each other and, and and just finding such great pleasure, you know, in interacting. So I love that story. Um, we are going to have a, a final presenter now, and um, I want you to keep using your Q&A. There's lots of stuff coming in there. So uh, I will turn it over to Amy. Sounds good. Thanks. Let me um, just make sure that I'm able to share my screen like I did five minutes ago.
I feel like not only do we not have a screen share, but I think perhaps we don't have an Amy. <laughs> Are you still there, Amy? Oh, she's coming back. Hi. Sorry about that. Let me okay. see. Take I your time. I, I have found AirMeet to be, um, it's actually a tool that's working really well, but the screen sharing part of it is uh, is trickier than Zoom for those of you who are at home watching this. I agree. I've been having some trouble with my, my camera keeps going out too. You know what? I apologize for this, everybody, but I'm going to jump into the other browser. I, I apologize. I will be right back. Maybe you could have a little I, conversation. I'm going to do some <laughs> while, I'm gone. while you're gone. No, we're, awesome. we're totally ready. Um, be right back. Actually, can I just throw a question? You go, Amy, do your stuff. Okay. I'm going to throw a question Thanks. to the other folks. Um, about syllabus annotation. Somebody mentioned it, and I'm not totally sure that all of our listeners would know what we mean by that, and it's such a great idea. Is there one of you guys who has um, maybe done that or wants to talk about what it means to do syllabus annotation with social annotation? I, I can take a, I can That's start. Because um, a professor who did syllabus annotation was actually a powerful moment here at Colgate. They did it and then that really kind of caught on here. Um, so I, we first encountered, the, the, this particular faculty member and I first heard about Remy Collier doing um, syllabus annotation. I don't know if someone from Hypothesis in the chat can, can reference Remy's affiliation with Hypothesis. He's at UC Colorado at Denver, but the idea is that you have students annotate your syllabus using hypothesis with the, thank you Mo, with the idea that um, it gives uh, students a chance to ask questions of things in the syllabus and, and enables you to check for their understanding of certain assignments. And I have seen a faculty member here actually, students asked questions about things that weren't clear in the syllabus. So they were able to correct it almost immediately. And then I think they did it in the first week of class. So by week two, they had a new syllabus that integrated um, a lot of students' comments. So I'll, I'll pause there to let that other people chime perfect in. perfect and great to get Remy's thing um, in there as well. So, uh, okay, Amy, how you feeling? I think we're good. Okay. Um, we'll give it a shot. Here we go. All right, can you see that okay? Perfect. Okay, very good. So um, uh, like Dana, I am a uh, instructional design uh, consultant. So I also teach in my own discipline, which is visual, visual art and art history. But my primary responsibility has been to work with other instructors to help them uh, shift their courses from a traditional face-to-face -face course to an online and a blended course. And in the process of doing that, I uh, support a number of technologies. Um, uh, the one that we're going to talk about today is Hypothesis. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit today about how our university came about uh, adopting Hypothesis. Uh, for those of you who are really interested in Hypothesis, but maybe don't know exactly how you're going to get it on, into your campus. Uh, so how we did it is that we worked through um, uh, an initiative that was already on our campus for open textbooks and open educational resources. Uh, so we have an initiative on our campus that has some funding associated with it. Uh, and so we write for funding every year to pay for Hypothesis. Uh, we first learned about Hypothesis, I think, um, I think, Maybe Robin, I think you said that you first learned about Hypothesis through Pressbooks. That's how we first learned about Hypothesis as a plug into Pressbooks. Um, but I immediately saw the, um, the value and the, um, the incredible uh, possibilities of Hypothesis. Uh, and so after um, that, we went through the process of um, adopting Hypothesis and integrating it into our LMS, which is Canvas. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, that as well. Um, one second here. Um, so, uh, again, one of the ways that we were able to pay for this is through um, 
uh, educational technology fees. Um, this is a student generated fee that is associated with the online programs at our university. And so we're able to, again, write for that funding and then be able to pay for uh, hypothesis that way. So our initial pilot, um, we were able to get Hypothesis integrated with Canvas. In Canvas, you can integrate Hypothesis either through an assignment um, where there is grading associated with uh, the uh, activity, or it can be an external uh, sort of tool that is um, uh, linked as a link. So there's no grading associated with it. Um, early on, we had Hypothesis come and do training for us, which was excellent. Uh, we learned a ton of really great ways to use Hypothesis in, in courses, and then we sort of uh, started to roll with it from there. Um, I've written quite a lot of documentation that sort of helps our instructors in a similar way that Dana was explaining, um, that helps our instructors uh, implement Hypothesis in their own classrooms. And then we also do quite a number of trainings, um, virtual trainings. So we had really amazing response. Um, I've said this before, but I will say it again. Um, the data that we got back uh, for our students and instructors was so incredibly strong. It's probably the most um, positive feedback that I've ever received in my whole career uh, for an instructional technology. And um, I'm, I'm a, a going on a 20 year veteran with a lot of different technologies that I have um, uh, rolled out in pilots and um, pushed out to the campus. And this is by far the most positive response. So our instructors, all of them, every one of them found it to be useful and they'd recommend it and they'd be disappointed if they couldn't use it again. Um, a couple of nice quotes. Um, I liked this idea that the instructors use this with their synchronous sessions. Um, there's, um, I think Amanda in our last session had some really great information about how uh, she integrated this in her synchronous session. So she was able to go back and read through um, information. And this is very similar to how our instructors did it, read through information that was uh, delivered inside of uh, Hypothesis uh, in the Canvas course site prior to the synchronous session, and then flesh that out and um, have the students continue to have conversations about that in the synchronous sessions. Um, they were really excited about the meaningful ways that the students uh, were engaging with the text. Uh, and then here's the really amazing part of it. Um, if any of you have um, done surveys with students uh, about educational technologies, um, it's, it's challenging for students to sort of have the, the, the distance or the metacognitive sort of ability to recognize how an educational technology has impacted their own learning. Um, and so very often you get sort of lukewarm <laughs> kind of responses from students, uh, but this response was incredibly um, uh, positive. So 95% of the students in our pilot found it to be useful and 75% would be disappointed if they couldn't use it again. Now, given the fact that they don't really, most of the students uh, uh, would rather not have to do the work, this is a really uh, positive feedback, 74%. Um, so here's a couple of nice quotes that I really liked. Um, it allows me to interact and converse with my, uh, with other students in an interesting, engaging platform. Uh, the readings are more engaging. And I really like this one. I think this goes over uh, back to Dana's comments about accessibility. Um, students that struggle with reading at a de decent pace um, and understanding written materials would really appreciate this tool. I normally have a hard time reading and have to reread things multiple times in order to understand and process information, but Hypothesis helps me to understand the material more quickly. So along with um, the accessibility features that Dean has already talked about, along with the open educational resources um, that we've really linked this to, um, there's also um, a comprehension, uh, and all of this is sort of building up to um, equity um, and, um, and ensuring that their student success, regardless of the student's background and regardless of what they're coming in uh, to the course, um, open educational resources are giving them access to textbooks uh, early uh, when they may not be able to afford the textbooks. Um, and then this um, ability to interact and engage with peers um, is really um, leveling that playing field and really making um, learning more accessible. 
uh, better understand and be able to engage with fellow um, students. It was, I love this. It, I felt like it was like reading a paper alongside everyone else uh, and, and we were talking as we went. So um, we ended up um, with such a positive uh, feedback, we ended up implementing this for our entire campus. Uh, we had a number of instructors who were really excited about it and voluntarily um, did presentations at our, um, our symposium that we have once a year. Um, so we had uh, um, use cases. Um, they gave a lot of um, ways that they were using it in their own class and their own feedback that they'd received. Um, and then some really nice um, information about some very detailed ways that they'd used it, including rubrics and things like this. So one of the additional uh, ways that we have implemented Hypothesis is to, um, to begin to roll out um, open educational resources and open textbooks in our schedule of classes. So what we've been able to do is to um, create a filter in our schedule of classes so that students can go in and uh, identify courses that are using open educational resources and in many cases, hypothesis, uh, so that they're able to sort of self-select into those courses. Uh, and so um, this has been a very um, positive uh, development on our campus. Um, just the last couple of things here, I wanna mention how one hypothesis is. I agree. Um, uh, I agree with, with uh, Christine. They've been wonderful at being able to support us and help us. Um, very good web-based documentation and materials. Lots of workshops. Um, really great um, support. So we've been really, really grateful for Hypothesis um, and all of the effort and time and energy they put into ensuring that we're um, using the tool properly and, and effectively. Um, I do have some additional data here from um, the pilot, uh, after the pilot, the immediate um, next semester. Um, after that initial pilot, we had a 340% growth in usage. So it, it's, um, it's sort of an amazing thing. Again, something I've not ever seen where the growth of the tool is really um, dependent on word of mouth from peers. And so rather than me going out and, um, although I do help, but rather than me going out and pushing this tool, it's really being spread by instructors talking to other instructors and getting them excited about it. So that growth is really grassroots. Um, so I won't go into some of these other, um, just to stay on time, but that we had really great responses both from students and instructors uh, and continue to have that uh, even after that pilot is over. So I will end there uh, and turn it back over to Robin. Thank you, Amy. That was really great. Um, if you get the impression that we are trying to sell you a hypothesis description, <laughs> And of course, look, I mean, come on, I'm wearing my hypothesis <laughs> shirt. What's even more embarrassing is that my husband's, I'm at home today, and my husband's walking around. We didn't do it on purpose, but he has his hypothesis shirt on <laughs> too. Um, but it absolutely is important to me, like so much you've talked about the responsiveness of the team there. And um, I, I just want to say, like, it's important to me that we are not selling you something, right? That this is a nonprofit endeavor. Um, and it really matters to me that we start looking at ethical ed tech um, that is responsive to educators. Um, and it's, it's one of the main reasons that I, I am interested in companies like this and companies like Pressbooks. Um, it's, it, it's really important, I think, that um, educators are at the front of ed tech and, and not, you know, industry, so to speak. So, hey, Phil. Come over here and rep your hypothesis t-shirt. Um, here he goes. Yeah, see, we're all here. All casual dressing today. Okay, go, go, go. Um, so anyway, this is great stuff. Um, and actually, I do want to say one thing, like, you know, and, and I've talked with Jeremy and others all over the years as we're talking about how to support, you know, nonprofit approaches to um, educational technology. And it's really tough, right? We And I think hypothesis doesn't have it all figured out. And um 
one of the ways that they that they do support the work is through the LMS integration where institutions can sort of contract with Hypothesis. Um, and so just to prove that I'm not working for Hypothesis, I want to ask panelists about that integration um, because I've kind of been of two minds about it. Like on the one hand, a lot of the five, I do faculty development now, and a lot of my faculty really appreciate that because the single sign-on aspect is really helpful. Otherwise, it's it can be challenging for students to navigate, um, you know, just how to get into their accounts and they forget their passwords and there's bookmarklets versus, um, what do you call them, the add-ons and plugins. Uh, so I think it's it's been really helpful. And that's how the bulk of my faculty like to use Hypothesis. But I've been so excited about the, the open web, you know, and the way that you can connect your students to folks who are annotating, you know, all across um, the world, really, and use Hypothesis as more of a tool outside of their um, walled garden of the LMS. So I'm curious uh, for you guys um, what you think about the LMS integration, how that's been helpful, if anybody's using it um, outside of the LMS, and if you just have anything to, to add about that. We don't really have a system for how you'll just do it. So I think just jump in and like answer. I don't think there's hands or you could just wave because I can see you all. So um, <laughs> sure, Christine, go ahead. Um, as I mentioned before, I've been supporting Hypothesis for like five years and beginning with faculty who were using the web based version of Hypothesis. So they um, have their students create a private group and then annotate privately, but on the open web. Um, so that worked and then it was, they now just use it in, we use Moodle as our LMS. And so I think one nice, one thing that faculty have appreciated about Moodle is students are there anyways, like for all their other courses and they know the platform and Hypothesis is such, it feels like such a, um, an easy tool to use within Moodle. It's not like a heavy lift. I think Moodle is a heavy lift as an LMS, but Hypothesis itself isn't. Um, so I think faculty have really, I've seen the faculty that I know who did it, the web-based free version have shifted to using it within Moodle and that has been a positive experience. However, if for the, the faculty who I've been supporting the longest are like my Hypothesis rock stars, if there was a pedagogical reason for them to be annotating out in the open, they understand what that means to annotate like on the open web. So I don't wanna make it sound like there aren't people who understand the power of that here at Colgate, but it does seem like, again, many of them made the shift at the height of the pandemic. <laughs> like we're going fully into Moodle. So I think that was part of the story here at Colgate, but yeah. Go ahead, Amy. Um, yeah, I agree with you, Christine. There's the, the single sign on, the ability to for students to move through their modules, you know, move through their exercises. They get to the assignment where they need to annotate a text. They annotate a text, their instructor can grade that text. That's the wonderful thing about, um, you know, the integration with Canvas at least is that um, it integrates with the speed grader. So this, the instructor can go right in, um, grade uh, work flows right into the grade book. They love that. Um, I, I was especially interested in Amanda's comments in the last session about the way that um, social annotation is different than um, discussions. And it's one of the main reasons why I was so fascinated with um, Hypothesis when I first saw it is because I'd, I'd spent you know 15 years supporting instructors using um, discussion forums in um, in, in their LMS. And this allows the students to annotate within and have a discussion within the context of the reading itself. And so again, the fact that it's integrated with the LMS, I think reinforces the fact that this is part of the course and that what the students are doing in that activity is, um, is furthering the their learning. It is about learning. Um, I think there's absolutely ways that in, in use cases, um, pedagogical need where a, an instructor would want to have an outside voice. But I love the fact that it's integrated and our instructors generally love the fact that it's integrated. 
Awesome. Um, there are lots of questions coming in, um, so we can get to some of those. I also wanted to mention, I was at a talk recently by um, Claire Major. I, I just, I think I just put that in the wrong place. I just put it as a question. I don't have a question about Claire Major. There you go. I put it in the chat now. Um, but she was talking um, about some of the myths that we have about the science of learning. Um, and she said, for example, it's actually the data doesn't support the idea that um, underlining or highlighting or even rereading affects reading comprehension very much. And what you really need to do is to move from um, into deep learning. And the way that you move into deep learning is by making those connections between, for example, students' prior knowledge and the text at hand, um, all the things that we do in, in annotation. Um, and I thought that that was really interesting when you were talking about sort of um, uh, the ways that that students say it really helps their comprehension. Um, and I think, you know, I've seen students who struggle with reading and then they show you like, look, I highlighted every word, you know, I spent so long on this and I still don't understand it. Um, but some of those gifts and those things that they're able to enjoy in the sidebar makes such a difference. So mm -hmm. I love that point. Yep, go ahead. Christine. I wanted to share, um, Robin, your example. You talking just now reminded me of an example of assignment that I saw a professor do. Um, you know, what's neat about hypothesis is that those annotations remain on the readings. So th I think this was for a final exam. A professor had their student go the assignment was go back and find like 10 or 12 annotations that have been made on previous readings in this course they can be your annotations they can be annotations from another student and go back to those annotations and re reply to those annotations and add additional um meaning or knowledge that you have gathered since the eight weeks that that annotation was first made. And again, I thought that was a really interesting way to leverage the tool to get at some of that deeper learning. Robin was talking about the idea that, you know, the annotations don't, don't have to end because the reading was due. And so I just thought it was really creative of this professor to like go back and let's use the annotations that have been made on the course and build upon them as evidence of your learning at this point at the end of the class. So again, I thought that was a really creative assignment. I love that. That is awesome. Absolutely. Yeah. Like a, steal like that a idea. Yeah. It's like a, um, you know, because that's what we're really trying to have students do is to, um, is, is, is have a, a better understanding of what they've learned and how it's impacting, you know, their lives and their, their um, academic experiences. And that, um, that metacognitive sort of um, analysis is really difficult to get students to do, but if they can go back and review material like that, it allows them to make those connections, not only to the things that are also, that they also learned in the course, but to other things in other courses and the things that are happening in their lives. So uh, that is really, really excellent. And again, the discussions only go so far with that because as we've said many times, those discussions are sort of at this high level, but the, the fact that it's in the context of that reading really grounds that in a completely different way. It's really, that's a really great example. Thank you. Uh, any other comments from Marites or Dana? Otherwise I can go on to another question. Yes. I just, I'd like to share a couple of um, other ways that um, some of my colleagues at Contra Costa College are using it. Um, I was able to share with you all how I'm using it in English and how um, it's really a useful tool for getting, um, helping students comprehend what they read. Um, but we also, uh, in our creative writing, we also have um, one of our instructors using it with groups of students um, who are exchanging peer review and giving feedback on um, each other's work. So that was um, another really creative way to use um, hypothesis. And we even have our journalism department using it um, and having students identify um, different strategies being used in news articles. Um, and then um, we even have our nursing faculty um, 
having students annotate, you know, a chapter um, here and there. So, um, so it's getting used not just in the like reading or writing classes, um, and so that's pretty pretty exciting to see. Um, and I see that Madeline has a question in the chat. If I can go ahead and respond to that um, about how you can use social annotation to help ESL students understand English better. Um, and so one of the, I mean, depending on the level, right, um, of the students that you're teaching, um, you know, I use it through when I teach ESL students um, to identify new vocabulary, just something as simple as you come across a, a new word, um, and then they have, um, you know, a series of things I want them to, to put into the margins um, for, for new words. Um, but ESL students also are um, practicing the same strategies as, you know, the native speakers um, so that they can also become um, really strong readers. Couldn't find my unmute for a second. Excellent. Um, thank you so much. Um, so I think I will go ahead and turn to some of the um, things that are in the Q&A. Um, some are a little more instrumental, some are a little more conceptual. So let's just see what we can um, pull out here. So the first uh, one, and I'm not sure, maybe uh, Dana or Amy might know, um, is do we have any data on hypothesis um, affecting enrollments at all? Um, I think a related question because I'm going to guess that maybe the answer to that is no, but if the, if the answer is um, that we're not sure about that is also just student success metrics in general, because I know we're all interested in enrollments, persistence, um, retention. Does anybody have any data or maybe hypothesis folks may have something to throw in the chat on that as well? It's okay if not. We don't have anything currently, but that's a really interesting, um, a really interesting thing to look at. Um, we we just we've just implemented that um, that filter uh, for open educational resources, and while that's not necessarily a link to hypothesis, it may give a little bit of a, a good idea um, how many of those courses are enrolling over other courses. But that's a really that's a really interesting um, data set to collect. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just ask the hypothesis folks, you know, if you have stuff like that, because um, I can certainly imagine it affecting um, even just things like DFW rates, you know, in, in a particular course. Um, so anyway, um, this is a question that came from, from Jeremy, and I think I, I would love everyone to answer this kind of just maybe in the order that we talked. Um, if you could just say what kind of an institution you teach at, for example, small, regional, public, or whatever, and how you think um, hypothesis uh, has, what specific challenges and possibilities arise for social annotation with the demographic or an institution like your own, because you are all at very different kinds of places. Um, so if you don't mind, Maritas, would you try... Uh, starting us off with that? Sure, yeah. Um, so our Contra Costa College is um, is on the smaller side. I'd say it's a small um, community college. Um, and we, I shared earlier that we have um, a huge student of color population, 90%. And we, um, I can't think of any specific challenges right now of, um, of, of, of anything that has arisen, um, we've, we've been gaining like actually more and more widespread usage um, of hypothesis in different departments. Um, so it's kind of exciting to see, you know, how, how it, it's spreading and other, when new faculty find out like, oh, well, wh what are you using? What's that? How can I try it out? Um, and so it just keeps, um, becoming more and more widespread. Uh, Dana? It is an interesting question. Um, I'd say that we're a larger university um, and uh, I, 
I would just return to not necessarily challenges, but the possibilities of social annotation. Um, one of the departments uh, that use hypothesis most uh, among all of their instructors is our writing department. And they, they usually teach um, fresh or incoming students so they get a good exposure to all the demographics of students that come to us. And they, and again, one of the benefits of hypothesis is the, the equalizing of voices. So whereas if you're having an in-person discussion, uh, typically it might be that certain students that are more comfortable with sharing, maybe male students, maybe white students, um, dominating a conversation. Hypothesis gives the power to all the students to use their own voice and give their own thoughts on things. And um, yeah, more empowering than, uh, than a typical in-person in discussion, in my opinion, but I was a shy student myself, so. Thank you. Um, anything to add, Christine or Amy? I can add a little bit to that. So we're a very large um, urban institution um, in Milwaukee. And so we have um, some unique challenges uh, for serving the population of our immediate regional area, um, which um, so we we struggle to um, retain students of color or um, uh, students who may be less prepared in some way for higher education. Um, so this tool, I think, I, I really believe that the the feedback that we received in the student um, comments, not only the um, the qualitative data, but that quantitative, or not only the quantitative data, but the qualitative data as well, um, really demonstrates that the students found this to be very useful for them. They learned um, more. And while we don't have clear data of how that um, connects to um, retaining those students from their first to second year, which is typically a very difficult um, uh, uh, thing to do at our institution, that transition from first to second year. Um, while there's not a clear connection, I think that that an anecdotal evidence is really, really clear. <laughs> It'd be really wonderful if we could find some, um, some direct connection uh, to back that up, but I think the anecdotal evidence is very clear. That is great. Um, there is another question in the chat and I'm hoping someone can find this link. I don't know if I can multitask and do it while I'm doing the rest of this, but it was about um, how to find ethical ed tech. Um, and, you know, one of the first things I did when I started working with Hypothesis was, you know, to look at their about page, you know, to figure out where their funding is coming from, you know, to look at who's on their staff. and. Um, I know that Bonnie Stewart, if some of you are familiar with Bonnie, she does a lot of connected learning stuff, but she did a, a project with her students at Windsor University, um, graduate students, I believe, where they created some kind of a rubric, I think, for evaluating ethical ed tech, and they ran a whole bunch of things through this rubric, I believe. Um, a hybrid pedagogy used to have a similar thing that you could access, and I can share some of that later if I can dig it out or maybe people can find it in the chat. Um, but I appreciate, you know, thinking not just about what the tool is capable of, but what's really the, um, you know, how is the tool built and with what purpose and um, what's the end game of the tool, right? Is it just um, for profit or is it, um, you know, really part of a educational ecosystem? Oh, it looks like Mo, is that, is that, um, the thing that Bonnie built maybe, I think. But anyway, um, Mo's got something in the chat there that you might wanna take a look at. That's an um, answer to one of the questions that was in the Q&A. Okay, I'm gonna go to another one. Um, and I can answer this if no one else can, but hopefully someone on the panel might do this uh, as well. Um, if you don't have a hypothesis license, um, but you wanna try this, and sometimes it kind of takes a first adopter to go out there and show that it works and then bring it into your IT, to your teaching and learning center and say, hey, look, I tried this thing. It was awesome um, before you can get people to sign on. So if you are one of those first adopters at your institution, um, it, can you do this without the support of your school or without a contract? And like, how 
how would you get started? I know in the Q&A, Hypothesis is offering lots of support, but has anyone um, done that or known of people who have just tried it on their own and had success? I wonder if um, Jeremy may help jump in on that if he's available. Um, we were able to um, have a pilot with Hypothesis um, that you know we were able to do without putting money forward at that point. Um, but he may have a better idea about what that is. Um, you know, if you wanted to try to use the tool, even if it wasn't integrated with your LMS, um, there certainly is the option to use the tool um, on web documents, right? Um, that are outside of the of the um, of the LMS. Um, in the last session, they talked about um, you you know using it on um, Word WordPress um, platform and. Um, uh, adding text through a WordPress platform and then annotating that text there. So I think it's absolutely possible to try it out um, uh, before, even without an LMS integration. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I've only ever used it outside the LMS and, and loved it. I think you will definitely hear the biggest challenge is just the lack of the single sign-on means people lose their passwords, they can't remember how to log in, and uh, it's always um, good fun there. But uh, I am seeing in my secret presenter chat that pilots are free this fall. So if you are interested in that, talk to the hypothesis folks, because they might give you an integration for no cash money down. Okay, Christine. Oh, I just wanted to say, um, you know, as a faculty developer, instructor, designer talking with um, faculty members about what can happen in Hypothesis, it has actually been really helpful to know about things that have been annotated in the public outside of an LMS so that I can sh have annotated documents to show to faculty members. So I want to share a couple resources in the chat. Um, one is the Marginal Syllabus Project. This, again, was um, the effort of Remy Collier. Um, and the Marginal Syllabus was this like open um, teacher professional development opportunity where um, teachers could um, annotate articles together about pedagogy. And knowing about the marginal syllabus was really helpful for me to be able to like, here are educators annotating articles about teaching. <laughs> so that was actually really helpful for me to kind of raise awareness about hypothesis because in workshops, it's hard. To, I don't want to show live examples of articles that have been annotated within Moodle within a course for privacy reasons. So just having that in your back pocket might be really helpful for raising awareness about um, hypothesis. And you know the annotation pane looks exactly the same whether you're annotating within on the open web or within your LMS. So I just wanted to that 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 was a powerful tool. And then one other um, resource. And this, again, I don't know when the last time this was updated, but a couple years ago, this um, hypothesis teacher resource guide was also really helpful. And actually, Robin, I think that that guide actually referenced some of your, your um, digital, your anthology assignment. So that resource was also really helpful because there are examples of annotation assignments and the things that were annotated as a result of that assignment. So those two things were really helpful for me to raise awareness about why hypothesis is a good investment. That's great stuff. Um, I am going to um, back us up into a kind of a conceptual question now. Um, and this has informed uh, some of you know Joshua Eiler, who wrote that great book, How Humans Learn. There's a whole chapter in there about social learning, like the social dimensions of learning that I learned a lot from. Um, so it, it, there's the sort of learning science aspect, and then there's you guys, like people on the ground in practice. So the question I want to ask is, why do you think social annotation, as opposed to just annotation, right? Because we used to all do that alone in our books. Um, what is it about social annotation? that really gets um, your students learning. Um, and you know that gets to things beyond annotation too, just collaborative learning in general. 
But um, I'm wondering if, um, I don't know, Maritaz, do you want to start us off with that? Sure, yeah. Um, the first thing that comes to my mind when I hear like the social part of annotating is the, the building of a community of learners and how important that is to maintain throughout the weeks of, of our classes. Um, and, you know, not just having it be something that we establish, but that it is maintained. And when, when students feel like they belong to a community and that they're part of, um, of, of, a, of a place or a space where trust is established, then they're gonna open up and they're gonna learn, <laughs> they're gonna be receptive to, to learning um, more than if they were in a space where they didn't feel like they belonged or they weren't included or um, where they didn't trust the people there. So I think it's just, it's fundamental. It, it needs to be there before the learning even happens. And can I ask um, a, a probing follow-up to that, Maritez, and then I'll, I'll ask the rest of you to jump in on this as well, except for Christine, who apparently I've lost the connection. Speaking of connection and social learning, we have lost connection, I think, with Christine. Um, but Maritez, I'm wondering if, um, and this is a question from the, from the um, audience as well, do you see any um, challenges or disadvantages to that collaborative and social approach to learning, either in social annotation or in general in your classroom? Maybe, it, maybe it's no. <laughs> no, I can't think of a disadvantage. Um, I think, you know, all students, all, you know, from diverse backgrounds want to um, be included and want to belong and feel part of a community um, regardless of, you know, all the diversity that they bring. So, um, so no, <laughs> I don't think there's any disadvantage. Um, seems fair. Uh, others want to weigh in on the benefits um, and or challenges of social learning. Amy. Um, I'll, I'll follow up with uh, the disadvantage question. Um, I, it came up in the last session, but um one thing that we we have had feedback from students is that it can be um, it can be overwhelming, like the number of posts or the you know responses. And so, um, again, this came up in the last session, but I think this is a really important strategy to ensure student success um, is the ability to read the text without the annotations first. Go back, turn annotations back on go back through the text again and make comments so that it sort of turns down the, the sort of noise so that students um, aren't overwhelmed by that so, sort of social interaction or just the visuals, you know, um, overly stimulated kind of <laughs> environment. So I think that's really um, important uh, as, a, as a really successful strategy. Um, I, I also wanted to mention, at least for, especially for students at our institution, um, we frequently hear from students that that they they're coming into higher ed, and this goes um, back to your comments about students, um, you know, feeling like they belong, which is so important, right? Um, frequently, they're coming into to our institution with with, with and they have and they uh, admit to having sort of a um, imposter syndrome where they they don't know if they are smart enough, they don't know if they belong, they don't know uh, how you know they just don't know. Um, and one of the things that Hypothesis is wonderful at doing is making transparent the learning that's happening. Um, it makes transparent the, the questions that others have, the confusions that others have, um, you know, the, the, the comments that others have. It demonstrates to students that they aren't alone. They're not alone. And I don't know what this means. I don't know what they're even trying to say. You know, that, may, that kind of shared <laughs> strife um, is really, really important. Um, I think in making students feel like, you know, they're not alone and it's going to be okay. And, um, you know, and not knowing is part of the journey and uh, ambigu ambiguity is part of the journey. Um, and so it, it sort of, it helps students become scholars, become 
um, be become, um, identify themselves as learners, identify themselves as scholars. I think that's great. Yeah, Christine. Yeah. Just a bit of a story um, where something I observed the fall 2020, when our use of hypothesis really went up, something that I observed was faculty members reporting to me was students like jockeying for the thing to annotate. So this sense, and, and then upon further reflection with the faculty member, it was a poor annotation assignment. Like there's the tool, but then there's the framing of like, why are we using this? And I learned that this was like a STEM class, research articles, students had to um, annotate, like, what was it? It was like, what re what type of research design is being used? And I was like, but that's mentioned only one time. So of course, only one student is going to be able to be the first to annotate that. So I'm just, I share that story around like, there's social norms that you have to one build and construct within the, your I'm not sure if Christine is breaking up for the rest of you. Is that happening or is it more of like okay. a beach design? Yeah. Um, Christine, we are kind of losing you a little bit. So I'm, I'm, it might be me. I don't know. Um, Let's see, I uh, I also wanted to note somebody in the chat made a really good point. Um, it's Now the chat's going crazy, so it's way back there, but it was also about privacy. I think, um, you know, for some of you who are working inside the LMS in a small group, it looks a little bit more like a traditional discussion board. Um, but even so, that can be difficult for some students. But certainly when you get out onto the web, there's lots of challenges if you're using hypothesis outside of the LMS. And I think I can say, you know, best practice is certainly to make sure you as an instructor know about internet privacy. Um, and if you don't, then don't, don't go in the web with your students, you know, until you take a semester or two to learn. Um, and then always to honor your students' agency about what they share and how they share and when they share. Um, so in that case, um, another sort of UDL guideline, right, is to offer multiple ways to reach, multiple pathways for reaching learning outcomes. So I could imagine, especially with social annotation in public, um, some students who really would not want to participate with that for real, in that for really good reasons. So I think the privacy conversation is one we have to talk about with all of the technologies that use um, connected learning. So it's a great point. Um, we don't have too much time left. So I thought I would ask one final question and uh, maybe ask each of you to jump in, maybe starting with, with Dana, if you want. But I'm curious, when you think about um, social annotation, um, what are the pedagogical values that this speaks to? Uh, again, sort of getting away from the idea that it's just fun to use like a new tool because for the most part it's really not we're all in air meet now it's not that fun to use a new tool so beyond that um what are the values that make you think um that that this is really worthwhile that connect on a deeper level to what you think is important about education so let's start with with dana i think the value that really resonates with me in particular thinking about my own learning as a student would be the the active learning component that comes with hypothesis. Um, I wasn't one that would, I read things in class, but I wasn't one to ever annotate prior to, to learning about hypothesis. And sometimes if I'm not making notes on things, I'll, I'll lose it, even if I reread it, even if I come back to it again. Um, hypothesis and just annotation in general really helps me retain that knowledge. Um, so it's much, much more lifelong learning in that sense. And um, I think that's also reflected with the students. Love it. Uh, Amy. I was looking for my mute button too. Um, I think in, in my uh, opinion, the value that it really um, connects with is equity. Um, and this really is in line with our open educational resources, how this all got started and how this is really integrated in our campus. Um, 
not only being able to give students access to materials, but give them um, tools that they can um, leverage those materials, learn those materials a new way, in new ways, um, uh, connect with peers. Um, I think that I. Th I think equity would be my um, big takeaway for that, the, the biggest value that it has, um, at least for our institution. Um, and I'm going to ask uh, Mary Taz to have the last word. Christine is, is going to type in the chat because she's still having some um, Wi-Fi issues. So go ahead, Mary Taz. I would say um, an important value would be uh, inclusion. And it kind of ties to, you know, what Dana and, and Amy have already said about um, equity and active learning. Um, you know, in the, when you're in an on-campus classroom, you have such limited time. Um, only a few students get to contribute to the discussion. But um, with a tool like Hypothesis, um, all students can participate. Um, students from all different backgrounds, students with disabilities, quiet or shy students who probably would not have said anything in the classroom. It, um, it includes them in the learning conversation. That's great. Um, we did have a request, I don't know if it was in the chat or the Q&A, um, for presenters to share their slides. Um, so if you do have a method of doing that, um, I encourage it. I, I don't know if we can, if we can find you all after we leave air meets, but I'm sure they'll put things in the chat if they have them accessible that way. Otherwise, um, it's the hypothesis folks. I, yes, I'm getting a private message. We can send them out with the recording. Um, so that would be great if you don't mind sharing those slides. There was lots of great stuff. Um, I have also been asked to plug um, the I guess you want to say 2 p.m. I don't know why that makes sense because it's quarter to five over here where I am. Um, and I'm sure you guys are all over the world, but um, 2 p.m. for those of you uh, who are on West Coast time, uh, Jer 2 p.m. Pacific, um, Jeremy is going to be giving some, some closing remarks and we hope that you will stick around for that uh, 5 p.m. Eastern. Um, Again, Jeremy is where I got this t-shirt, guys. So I encourage you to listen to him and also just be super nice to him when you see him out at a conference because he has got swag um, and he will send it your way. Um, I really want to thank these folks. Uh, the thing I love most about Hypothesis, um, it's not super fancy. Um, it's just trying to connect people um, and it's trying to connect people in the spaces that we know are important, right? The books, the texts, the ideas, the work, right? There's nothing fancy about it. It just suggests that if you connect people and you connect ideas and you put it all together, um, you can have really rich educational experiences. So I think talking about hypothesis with people who are actually like doing teaching and learning is just one of the most fun things. So um, thank you all for being here. And Wendy in the background there, thank you for putting all of this together. Um, and I guess you will go to the lounge and to Jeremy. Oh, I think, I don't know, even know if I'm still here, but anyway, my connection may be interrupted. That's good timing. Nope. <laughs> okay. You're good. Bye everybody. Good. And we'll see you at the closing remarks. Thank you. Bye.